Smoke Pit Fairy Tales by Trip Ainsworth. Chapter 11. Cadences and Cadences. I stood alone in the darkness. It was hot. I could feel the sand beneath my boots shift. There was a light. Doc stood there with just enough fire coming from his flamethrower to illuminate the area around us. I started to say something to him, but he motioned for me to be quiet. He pointed behind me. Looking into the darkness, I saw several sets of eyes watching us from the black. The eyes moved to the light. It was Kennedy and her father. More sets of eyes came. About 50 Iranian soldiers and a few Taliban fighters. The last set of eyes came and they belonged to satin sheets. The ground started to shake and we stumbled into the sand. A hoofed leg protruded from the ground, then another. Before us grew a giant freak of a thing. It looked like a bull, but with the head of a man and a long black beard. He raised one of his hoofed hands to us. It was holding a castle made of one gargantuan diamond. Doc dropped the flamethrower, but the light stayed. The monster's eyes illuminated the space. Holes opened in the sand. Long, twisted arms seized everyone around us and dragged them underground. No one screamed. They just glared at us until they vanished below. Doc grabbed a spear and hurled it at the bull man. I drew my sword. Flares from a mortar team exploded, lighting everything with a yellow, hazy glow. A field of severed heads on pikes surrounded us. The monster disappeared, and the sands turned to ankle-high water. The pikes transformed into wolfberry bushes. And then I woke up. It didn't register me where I was, and uh, quickly and violently I sat up. I felt rips and tears in my body and laid back down. I pushed my eyes shut and grabbed at the pain in my abdomen. I felt around. Where's my flak? I opened my eyes to look. No flak, no dirt, no stench of burning flesh. The stench was of rubbing alcohol. I was in a hospital room. What the hell are all these tubes? I was choking. I had a tube in my mouth. I pulled about a foot of thick plastic out of my throat, then an air tube from my nose. I looked around to see a row of hospital beds stretching into the darkness. It was nighttime. I rubbed my face and was surprised to find a decent amount of facial hair. I ran my hands over my body. My arms were terribly weak. I felt for my dick. Ah, oh, thank God that's still there. What's this fucking thing? I pulled a catheter out of my shaft. I tried to sit up, but there was yet another pipe stuck up my ass. I yanked it out with a grunt. I pulled the last piece of plastic out of my arm. Slowly, I sat up and swung my legs over the mattress. I looked down the row of beds. Everyone was lying straight on their backs. I thought that was strange. No one sleeps on their back. Holy shit, shit Bland's here. He was laying still on the bed next to mine. He had weird burns on his arms. They almost looked like a chain link fence. What happened to him? Keeping a grip on the bed frame, I lowered my feet to the floor. It was cold. I let go of the bed and stood for a moment before the floor was so kind as to introduce itself to my face. I laid there for a second with stars dancing behind my eyelids. I clawed back at the bed and pulled myself to my knees. Every muscle in my body was weak. I forced myself to my feet, keeping as firm of a grip on the bed as I could. I grabbed the IV stand and used it to stabilize myself. I walked to the end of the hall. My legs trembled from the weight and my arms shook from the strain. Who knows how long it's been since they'd moved last. There was a small office at the end. A light shined through the window. A short blonde woman in scrubs was doing paperwork at the desk. Behind her hung an army uniform. Well, at least I'm in a military hospital. I knocked on the window. The woman's head jolted up at me. Her eyes were wide. Her mouth gaped open. The woman jumped up and opened the door. What are you doing? I don't know. I uh, just woke up. She pointed down the hall. In here? Uh, yeah. The woman took my arm. Sit here, sir. She sat me in a chair in her office. Hold on a minute. I'll be right back. She sprinted down the hallway. Um, uh, all right. I sat in the chair naked except for a hospital gown. I looked up at the uniform hanging on the wall. It had a captain's insignia on it. She looked a little young to be a captain, but, you know, what the hell did I know? After a few minutes, she walked back with a Navy commander in a khaki uniform. Hey, good evening. Or morning. Uh, what, what time is it? Who are you? The commander asked. I I showed him my hospital bracelet. I, uh, Corporal Hank Thomas Allensworth, 1st Marine Division, combat camera. I'm attached to 2nd Battalion. And you were in this hall? The commander cut me off. Yes, sir. W what's the big deal? The blonde captain handed the commander a file. 
You're supposed to be brain dead. Well, my first sergeant thinks that too, but uh, that doesn't keep me from eating crayons. I thought about what I said. I mean, not eating crayons? I scratched my temple, adding, I, I don't eat crayons. The commander flipped through the file. Okay, Marine. Well, we're glad you're awake. We need to do a complete physical and a few other medical procedures. Well, my, my arm shrank. Uh, can you guys get me my gains back? I uh, look like I don't lift. They both looked at me blankly. Well, at least you're in good spirits, the captain said. We're going to move you down a few floors to another area. What's uh, wrong with this place? No one in this hall is ever expected to wake up again. A sick feeling grew in my gut. Oh. I took a deep breath and looked out the window. I couldn't see much besides snow. Last I remembered, it was July or August. Did I uh, forget a bunch of shit or have I been out for a few months? We'll explain everything to you in a little bit, the commander said. But let's get you moved first. Well, can I get some pants at least so I don't have to walk around with my dong waving all over the place? I don't want to get court-martialed for sexual assault for bumping into the wrong person in the hallway. Yeah, we'll grab you something to wear. They led me down another hall to an elevator. I was moved to a different side of the building and shown to a room. They helped me along so I didn't have to stumble with my IV cane. It was about half the size of a barracks room with white brick walls, a small bed with a green wool U.S. issue blanket, a metal desk, and a small television. There was an adjoining bathroom with a small shower and a toilet. They left me alone for a few minutes. The captain came with a thin pair of blue pants and a shirt. These should hold you off for a while. Thanks, ma'am. I took the clothes. What was your uh, name again, ma'am? Captain Frame. Killer. W when's breakfast around here? At 06. Just down the hall here. I'm on shift right now. I'll come get you when it's time to eat. But if you're really hungry, I can grab you something from the vending machine. What time is it now? Zero four. I can wait. Thank you, though. The captain left me alone in the room. I checked myself out in the mirror. I had a decent-sized beard, and whatever happened to me didn't screw up my face. My tattoos were all where they were supposed to be, but my body was almost completely withered away. It looked like I just got released from fucking Auschwitz. I found the remote to the TV and put on the new clothes. I turned on the tube looking for the news, but there was an action movie on. It had been my favorite since I was a kid. It was about a special forces team in the jungle being hunted by an alien. I said to hell with the news and sat on the bed watching the movie. When the commercial breaks came, I didn't recognize any of the ads. That was usual. You need to deploy for a while and the ads change. They could have made more comical ads, though. After a car insurance ad went off, a man in a suit appeared on the screen. Hello, America. This is your president. What? what? We've been through a lot since the turn of this century, and I want you to know you can count on me to... This guy's the president? I thought to myself. How the fuck long have I been out? I don't know who the hell that guy is. The election wasn't supposed to be until this year. If it's the winter, I think it is anyway. It's at least two years from now. I've been out for two years? I scrambled to find a calendar with no luck. I grabbed the remote and turned on the TV to a news channel to try to find the date. The anchor was talking about the disappearance of some pop singer. Who the fuck cares about that? I slapped the television. Calm down, Hank. I said to myself. Just ask the captain later. It'll be easier than trying to figure things out watching the fucking news. I sat down and turned back to the channel with the movie, but I, I didn't pay attention. Captain Frame came around a little before six and took me to the mess hall. I don't know how the food was. It tasted great to me, but I hadn't eaten anything in God knows how long. I scarfed it all down before the captain was halfway done with the meal. Hey, we're, we're in uh, Bethesda, right? Yeah, how'd you guess? The uh, TV commercials weren't AFN, so we're not in Germany, and it's snowing, so we're not in Balboa. Good reasoning. Was there anything good on? Well, I uh, saw the president, and I've uh, never heard of him before. Must have been out for a while. Yeah, I guess there's been a lot of changes since you've been out. How long's it been? Captain Frame reached into a satchel and pulled out the file from earlier that morning. Are you sure you want to talk about this right after you ate? Yes, ma'am. She flipped through the file and set it down next to her plate. Sixteen months ago. That's it? I thought it had to be at least two or three years because of the president and all. No, he just took office. Oh, so it's my next January. February. Sixteen months ago, you were wounded in a combat in Shash, Iran. You were shot 23 times. You had over a hundred pieces of shrapnel in you. The bones in your limbs were shattered. Almost all of your skin was covered in third-degree burns. And it's estimated you lost two-thirds of your blood. You were pronounced dead on the evacuation helicopter. Navy medical personnel were about to load you into a coffin at a morgue in Kuwait when they noticed you were breathing. You were shipped to Germany until your wounds had healed enough to bring you to Maryland. Your body made a pretty fantastic recovery, but readouts from tests on our medical equipment estimated that you would be brain dead for the rest of your life. Huh. 
I stared into the captain's eyes with a bewildered look on my face. Do you know uh, anything that... Uh, what, what about happened to Doc? Who? Sorry, uh, w Wilson Evans. He was my corpsman. The last thing I remember was that we were in a firefight. I uh, kind of got separated and got shot up, and I was bleeding out. He came back for me and hauled me off. That's the last I remember. Images of Doc's pistol on my hand firing at the enemy found their way to my mind. I can look him up for you. I would appreciate that, ma'am. I looked at my reflection in the napkin dispenser's metal side. I don't have that bad of scars from all this. Why, why, have, why have I healed so well? We don't know. Maybe God loves you. Maybe you're a freak. Oh, well, well, what else did I miss besides the president? A lot. A lot like we beat the Iranian military and now we're bogged down fighting another insurgency? Actually, no. More and less than that. It turned out that the Iranian people were tired of the government's crap and are working well to rebuild their nation. All the people who would have resisted us, the theory now is that we killed all of them when they came to fight us in Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, uh, all right. So, I probably won't be going back then. The captain took a sip of her coffee. No, probably not. But before you go running around or watch too much television, there's something you ought to know. Okay, uh, what? Are we at war with China or Russia now? No, and I personally don't think that'll be happening anytime soon. No? I think this actually happened before you were wounded. But I can understand why you wouldn't know. I know how slow news moves when you're downrange. But we made contact with extraterrestrials. <laughs> you're, you're shitting me. I'm not. I kept my smile. Well, cool. Are we speaking to them via Morse code or the Voyager find them out past Pluto? Their ship showed up in orbit. After a couple of months, several countries left in enclaves as refugees. Holy shit. I looked skeptically at Captain Frame. Show me a picture. The captain pulled out her phone and brought up a news article about the aliens. Look for yourself. She handed me the phone. Whoa. Right? Is this an iPhone 5? Huh? This thing's ancient. You can't afford a new one? How fucking bad is the economy? She snatched the phone back. It's not that bad. I just don't see the point of getting a new one when this works just fine. <laughs> okay. You're not worried about the aliens? Why would I be? If they've been here this long and haven't killed us all yet or made us slaves, I doubt they will. The captain smiled. <laughs> I guess that's a good way to look at it. Yeah. Ma'am, you don't by chance have a cigarette, do you? She looked at me sternly. A cigarette? You're in a hospital, and by all accounts, you shouldn't be alive, much less have limbs. Well, I have arms, legs, and lungs. You know cigarettes kill you, right? Well, apparently I can survive some tough shit. I think I can manage a cigarette. She stared at me. My shift's over and I'm leaving. What brand do you want? Uh, Lucky's would be nice, but if not, I'm, I'm okay with the red. All right, I'll have something for you before I come in tonight. Captain Frame went out for the day, and I was left at the mercy of the physicians who poked and prodded me. I wasn't injured anymore. The doctors said it was miraculous that I healed as much as I did. I had some aches and pains, but apparently they were from moving too fast after such long inactivity. During chow, I sat with the other patients. They told me how the war was going, or should I say, how the rest of the war went. Iran was taken a few weeks after I was knocked out. There had been pockets of insurgency, but the people of Iran were fed up with their governments and didn't want another similar regime, so they stomped out that insurgency fairly quick. There were a lot of people there that identified as Persians, not Arabs, and didn't like how the government oppressed their culture in the name of Islam. I was happy that Iran wasn't turning into yet another 10-year war. When I was done being examined for the day, I went back to the room and waited for Captain Frame to return to work. She finally returned around 7 with a pair of Luckies. I asked her to come smoke with me outside. Outside, I opened a pack of cigarettes and tinkered with a cheap lighter. I wish I had my Zippo. Yeah, I can't be sure, but I'd imagine your stuff is in a warehouse with your parent comment. The captain said. Yeah, you're probably right. I inhaled the smoke, closing my eyes and enjoying the feeling. Have you uh, found out anything about my friend? Evans? Yes, ma'am. He's at Balboa Naval Hospital. You know how he's doing? Well, apparently he's stationed there. He's not a patient. Yeah? I smiled. Good for him. I couldn't find too many details, but they gave him a Navy Cross. Well, shit. I took another drag. He fucking deserves it. Do you want to talk about it, Corporal? Nope. I wrapped my arms around each other. It was still snowing. Have you gotten any sleep yet? I've been asleep the better part of two years. I don't, I don't need sleep. I need some warmer clothes, my Jeep, and a bottle of rum. 
You should be able to go back to your command here in a few weeks. Or at least when your medical work comes back and you're cleared. I looked at the cold concrete below us. That'll be good. Pendleton, right? Yeah, it'll, it'll be warm. We stood there in silence for a minute and I lit another cigarette. Have you made any phone calls out yet? I tried to call my girlfriend, but I, I think she changed her number. It's some Mexican family on the other end now. I was still looking at the ground, but I could sense the captain frown. <laughs> Jody got her? I didn't want to tell the full story. Not to anyone. Especially some soldier I just met. No, she, she was Iranian. Oh. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the smokes, ma'am. I stayed in Bethesda until April. They wouldn't let me drink, and it was a pain in the ass to get smokes. There were other veterans there, but I didn't want to talk to any of them, so I kept to myself. The most interaction I got was when the doctors came to check on me. At night, I would stare at the ceiling until I passed out alone with my thoughts. They chopped my orders and sent me back on a plane to California. I didn't have anything besides a phone and a couple sets of uniforms. I was glad I didn't need to check a bag. I caught a shuttle from San Diego to Pendleton. After I checked in with the officer of the day, I walked over to our building, 2665, 1st Marine Division, combat camera. When I walked in the door, the PFC at the front desk gawked at the ribbons on my chest. Good afternoon, Corporal. Can, can I help you with something? I walked right past them. You checking in, Corporal? Walking through the door to the back of the building, I muttered, Shut up, boot. No one stopped me on my way to Gunnery Sergeant Cantute's office. I paused before his door in the hall. Gunny was in there chewing someone's ass. After a moment, I said fuck it and walked in. First, Gunny looked at me in anger, wondering who had the gumption to just walk in during an ass chewing, and then shock. Get the fuck out of my office! He ordered the Marine in the room. As soon as he'd left, Gunny jumped up and squeezed me with his arms. Allensworth, you son of a bitch! He grabbed my shoulders and shook me. Where the hell? I thought you were supposed to be in a fucking coma until Christ came back. The doctors got tired of me shitting my pants in my sleep, so they woke me up and kicked me out. Fuck me running. You just get back? Yeah, like, just, just. I haven't even got a barracks room yet. So you came right back? They let you take leave or anything yet? No, they packed me up and shipped me home. I'll put in a leave request tomorrow. I'm just gonna go check in my shit today and try to get my Jeep out of storage. Alright, cool, man. Gunny rubbed his chin. Write down your phone number for me in case we need you for whatever reason and come back on Monday. I left Gunny's office and walked to the smoke pit. I lit a cigarette and looked around to see what had changed. Our building was the first in a row of old Korean War era squad bays. The smoke pit was between our building and the chemical warfare guises. We had an old picnic table out there. It was battered and worn. The wood was falling apart. The whole thing would lean if you put any amount of pressure on it. It was painted black and had our platoon logo stenciled in with yellow paint in the center. Combat camera marines had been carving their names into it for about 20 years. I finished my cigarette and went to the billeting office. They put me back in the same barracks, colloquially known as Castle Grayskull. It was five stories of rough cut cinder blocks on the face of a cliff in the Pendleton Mountains. Whoever designed it didn't have drunken marines in mind. The marine at the billeting office said I was going to be in a room with Lance Corporal. On paper, our marines were supposed to share rooms with someone of the same rank, but that goes out the window when the barracks reaches max capacity. I walked into my new room. It was fairly empty besides the stock furniture. I unpacked what little I had and changed to a pair of jeans and a plain black t-shirt I picked up in transit from Maryland. I grabbed my cigarettes and started to walk out, but the door opened. Okay, let's see the fuck they room me with. It was a Claire. He looked at me in utter shock. Hey, what's up, man? Uh, nothing much. Just getting off work. He said, confused. Cool. You want to drive me to the liquor store and get fucked up? I thought you were dead, man. So is that a no? No, I'm down, man. I'm just a little freaked out now. Well, I'm not a ghost. You sure? I pulled out my lighter and ignited the flame by Eclair's face. He swatted my hand away. Okay. Okay. Eclair smiled. Holy fucking shit, man. Eclair drove me down to Pendleton's liquor store. He had bought a 1969 Camaro when we got back from Iran. I grabbed a bottle of rum, two liters of DP, and a carton of Lucky's. They had a Zippo display by the counter, so I got a new lighter, too. We got back to the barracks and started drinking. Eclair got a 24-pack. I mixed my rum and TP, and we blasted John Lee Hooker on the stereo. So you get that Camaro right when you got back? Yeah. I got a pretty good deal on it, too. When'd you get back? I walked out to the catwalk to smoke. About six months ago. They kept us over there for a while. Eclair followed me. Oh. Oh, well, shit, man. How far did you guys make it? Almost to Afghanistan. That shit was fucked up. You're telling me, man. I did two pumps to Afghan without a scratch, unless you count food poisoning, prickly heat, or dog bites, then I go to Iran and get three fucking purple hearts. I don't know how you survived that, man. I really don't remember what happened. I saw it. I was in the building with Fox. I took a long swig from my glass and lit another cigarette. What happened? You were 
You were behind a helicopter. Everyone was shooting everything. That other Marine grabbed four or five other dudes and drugged them to a trench before he came to you. That was my corpsman, uh, Doc Evans. Oh, my bad, dude. Anyway, he grabbed you and started running towards us. We were giving Haji everything we had, trying to suppress their fire, and then we started taking artillery. One of the shells landed right on top of you guys. Fuck. Yeah, I don't remember that much. I'm surprised as fuck you're still alive at all right now. And you have skin and your limbs. I thought if you lived, you'd be like that poor fuck from one. Yeah, I'm not sure what the hell's going on. The docs at Bethesda thought I was going to be a slug for the rest of my life. They said I was pronounced dead on the bird out. That's what they told us. That you guys were waxed. Yeah. I need to get a hold of Doc. I heard he was down in Balboa. I don't really know him, man. It's cool. So what's this bullshit I hear about aliens and shit? Eclair shook his head. <laughs> that shit? I don't know. They just showed up one day. Apparently we were still in Iraq when they made first contact. I haven't ever talked to any of them, but they're all over San Diego. Really? I raised an eyebrow. Well, if I could live anywhere in the world, I'd probably stay in SoCal too. Well, not all of them are there. They spread out all over the planet. They have little groups here and there. I think that's just where the government stuck them. But apparently they're mixing in with people and getting jobs and shit. Oh, so they're actually integrating and being productive members of society? Yeah. Good for them. I drank that night until I passed out. Claire hit the rack before I did. He had to go to work the next day. And thank God for alcohol. It got me to sleep that night without having to lie there for three or four hours. I hated being alone with my thoughts at night. I would always find a way to think myself into a downward spiral and end up feeling like shit. I woke up the next day around 10. I caught a ride up to the supply warehouse and checked out my Jeep and personal effects. The Jeep was running a little sluggish. To be fair, it had been sitting for about two years. I dropped it off at a mechanic out in Oceanside and walked to the 101 Cafe. The sun felt good on my skin. It was warm, but not blistering hot. There was a slight breeze, and the air smelled like the ocean. I walked into the restaurant. Nothing had changed. The red and white walls, the shine metal accents, the old photos. I ordered eggs, grits, bacon, coffee. I never found out what that brand was, but that was the best damn coffee on the planet. Sue, the waitress, told me that Rochelle had gotten married and moved up north. Her new husband did something with railroads. I caught up with Sue while I ate, and when I was done, I walked down to the beach and sat there in the sand in my jeans and converse and stared at the ocean until the mechanic called me. After the jeep was fixed, I drove back to the barracks and unloaded my stuff. I took the doors off, collapsed the soft top, and headed back out. I took Highway 76 East and drove until I hit San Marcos. I fueled up and drove up into the desert. I didn't have anywhere to go or anywhere to be. I just aimlessly drove around the desert until about midnight, seeing nothing but what the headlights illuminated. I let the music do the thinking for me. I knew that if I got a hotel, I wouldn't be able to sleep. I put Appetite for Destruction in my CD player, cranked the volume to 11, and headed to San Diego. I got breakfast at some diner outside of the city and rolled into Balboa Naval Hospital around 8. I walked up to the counter and asked the woman on duty to see hospitalman Third Class Wilson Evans. The woman asked me to take a seat, and after a few minutes, someone else grabbed me and led me through a series of hallways. We stopped at a door, and the attendant knocked. Doc opened the door. Dude! Doc was surprised to see me. Dude! He pulled me in for a hug. How you doing, man? Fucking alive, bro. The attendant left back down the hall. What the hell, man? I thought you were working here. What's up with the patient room? What made you think I was working here? That's what they told me in Bethesda when I tried looking you up. They said you got a Navy Cross, and now you're working here. Yeah, well, I'm technically a patient. But since I'm a corpsman, they've been letting me help out. Doc stepped out of the room and closed the door. Let's go smoke, man. We walked outside and across the street. You're not all to smoke on hospital property. I asked Doc, So have you been here the whole time? Yeah, man. You said you were in Bethesda? Yeah. Uh, they, they said they thought I was brain dead, and I shocked the shit out of them when I woke up. Really? Brain dead? Yep. I told them my first son would probably agree with them. They told me the same thing. When did you wake up? Uh, February. Why? Me too. Weird. Has anyone told you what happened to us? No. No one knows anything except that something happened to us. I barely remember it. I got shot to shit pulling those marines out of fire. Then I remember running back towards the helicopter and finding you. But my vision was blurry and it was dark. I don't even know if I'm remembering that right. You remember Eclair? Comcam buddy and Fox? He saw the whole thing. Apparently we got hit with an artillery round. Doc stared at me. Then how the fuck are we alive? And how are we not charred to a crisp and limbless? I shrugged. Fuck, dude. Doc took another drag from his cigarette. I guess we should be grateful. 
I question. What's that? Your tattoo sealed, right? Yeah. Why? Mine too. Huh. What do you think's up with that? I, I don't know, man. Doc glanced at his watch. Hey, hey, man. I gotta get going with some shit here. I should be back in Pendleton in a couple of weeks. I scored, dude. Let me the fuck up when you get back. A month went by. I did very little besides drive around aimlessly, drink myself to sleep, and dick around with Eclair. I showed up to work, but I didn't really do anything. I hadn't stopped accumulating time and service points while I was knocked out and got promoted to sergeant. I abused my recent promotion to skate out of work. The last Friday of the month, the battalion commander decided he wanted to have a formation run with the whole unit. The colonel wanted to start running at 08, so the company commanders wanted us at the field around 7, which led our individual section staff and COs to have us there at 6. That may sound stupid, but that's the way it works. We were all standing around in formation, waiting for something to happen, when I saw Doc walk by. He was in his full uniform, not his PT gear like us. He was wearing his flak jacket and Kevlar. We must have made him the safety driver for the run. I wonder why the hell he didn't say anything to me when he got back to Pendleton. One of the other Marines yelled out, Hey man, why are you getting in the Humvee instead of running? Before Doc could answer that obviously stupid question, I yelled out, It's cause you're fucking fat, Doc! Doc looked over at me and raised his palms. Really, dude? Then he squinted to see who called him out. Dude, what's up? Freezing my balls off in green on green. When'd you get in? Last night. Figured. Find me later. Will do. We stood in formation in our green shorts until the colonel decided to grace us with his presence. We were called to attention and we ran towards the main side of the base in a square made of people screaming our cadences. Halfway up the first hill, Eclair got called out of the formation to call cadence. Eclair started up. My girlfriend is a vegetable. My, My girlfriend, girlfriend is, is a vegetable. vegetable. She lives in a hospital. She, she lives, lives in, in a hospital. hospital. She ain't got no arms or legs. She ain't, she ain't got, got no, no arms or legs. legs. All she's got is hooks and pegs. All, All she's, she's got, got is hooks and pegs. pegs. And I would do anything. And I would do anything. To keep her alive. To keep her alive. She's got her own TV. She's, she's got, got her own TV. TV. And it's called EKG. And it's called EKG. One day I played a joke. One day I played a joke. I pulled the plug and watched your joke. I pulled the plug and watched your joke. The company first sergeant snapped up Eclair and threw him back in formation, telling him that his cadences were too insensitive. First Sergeant Charlie uh, had a hard-on for political correctness. That may be fine in the real world, but when your job is killing people, I think we rated a little slack. I think everyone resenting having leadership that dodged the last decade and a half continuous war by being a recruiter or a drill instructor instead of eating sand in the desert. One of the other Marines jumped out to sing the calls. Who can take your sister? Who can, Who can take, take your sister? sister? Tie her to a chair. Tie her to a chair. Fuck her with a broom while your cousin pulls her hair. The S&M man. Fuck her with a broom while your cousin pulls her hair. The S&M man. S &M man. Who can take a baby? Who can take a baby? Nail it to a board. Nail, Nail it to a board. Swing the run around by the umbilical cord. The S&M man. Swing the run around by the umbilical cord. Yes, and yes, man. And First Sergeant Charlie threw the Marine out of the formation and screamed at us. You Marines better start acting in line and quit checking around. He ran us silent for a minute and called out the next motivator. I jumped out in the formation. First Sergeant, First Sergeant, I'm in pain. First Sergeant, First Sergeant, I'm in pain. First Sergeant, First Sergeant, I can't train. First Sergeant, First Sergeant, I can't train. I've got sand up in my clit. I've got sand up in my clit. Tell Doc to give me a light duty chit. Tell Doc to give me a light duty chit. I switched out with another Marine before First Sergeant could find me to deliver the ass chewing. The cadences were somewhat tame for the next mile or two. Mostly that C-130 rolling down the strip and M-A-R-I-N-E-S cookie cutter bullshit. On the way back, I found myself next to one of the company clerks. The guys who hang out with the brass all day, doing the bullshit paperwork and fetching the officer's coffee. I asked them what the first sergeant's daughter's name was and then got back to call cadence. One, two, three and a quarter. One, two, a three and a quarter. I've got a date with the first sergeant's daughter. I've, I've got, got a date, date with the first sergeant's daughter. One, two, three and a dime. One, two, three and a dime. I told him I'd have her home by nine. I told her I'd have her home by nine. 
Even though she looks like a child. Even though she looks like a child. Like a child. That bitch gets up and goes buck wild. That bitch gets up and goes buck wild. First sergeant, first sergeant, he's a sucker. First sergeant, first sergeant, he's a sucker. He doesn't know how I'm gonna fuck her. He doesn't know how I'm gonna fuck her. She's a pretty girl, so we're in luck. She's a pretty girl, so we're in luck. Cause every time I see her, she always wants to fuck. Cause every time I see her, she always wants to fuck. Fuck for sergeant's daughter, laying his gangbang all day. Who we gonna gaming if his daughter Lena goes away? Who we gonna gaming if his daughter Lena goes away? Some girls work the gas station, some work the stores. Some girls work the gas station, some work the stores. Lena works in a house with 50 other whores. Lena works in a house with 50 other whores. LA girls use KY San Diego, girls use lard. LA girls use KY San Diego, girls use lard. Lena uses axle grease and fucks us twice as hard. Lena uses axle grease and fucks us twice as hard. Some girls like it soft and slow and some like it hard and fast. Some girls like it soft and slow and some like it hard and fast. Lena likes it hammered deep inside her ass. Lena likes it hammered deep inside her ass. I disappeared back into the formation and another Marine took my spot calling another bland cadence. First Sergeant Charlie screamed at us and demanded to know who was singing about butt-fucking his 14-year-old daughter. No one directed the blame in any direction. He didn't put up with any more of our crap and he called cadence for the rest of the run. When the run was over, the battalion commander dismissed everyone. First Sergeant Charlie held our company back and chewed her ass for about half an hour. He gave us the same bullshit rhetoric about professionalism, sexual harassment, being considerate of others' feelings, core values, and all that shit. When we were finally released, I walked to the Claire back to our building to shower. And Claire blurted out, What a fucking dumbass. I know, man. No deployment, bitch-ass fuck. I mean, it's like, hey, first sergeant, didn't you know there was a couple of wars going on? Fucking fleet dodger. How the fuck did that guy make it to first sergeant anyway? Because the Corps doesn't care about experience or how good you are at your job, they only care about how many pull-ups you can do, how fast you can run, and how you look in uniform. Dude, he should be fucking ashamed of himself. For being that high up with as little as he's done, I know shit, have twice as many awards as he does, and I'm a fucking Lance Corporal. Marine Corps doesn't actually respect veterans. I've heard a bunch of fucking morons site promoting boots and fucking pogues over combat vets saying shit like, Combat isn't a measure, it's an opportunity. And I'm like, well, first off, it's not that I can and he can't, it's that I did and he didn't. And after that, the Marine Corps' only mission is to win America's battle, so if you haven't been in a battle, then how the fuck can you ever justify doing your job? I hear you, Sergeant. Quit fucking calling me Sergeant when we're not at work. Sorry, but I know what you mean. There's always these twats saying, I just haven't had the opportunity. Well, I ain't no infantry, man. I'm a fucking camera guy, but I still found a way to go get some. Yep, and I'm not saying you have to see combat to be a real Marine, but if I've done something you haven't, as far as I'm concerned, you have no right to tell me shit. We reached our building. Eclair went in first. I noticed something strange about his feet. Eclair, where's your right sock? Oh, <laughs> I, I, I fell out of the formation to drop a douche in the bushes. Sacrifices had to be made. Thanks you for listening to Smoke with Fairy Tales Chapter 11. I would like to thank my voice actors, Dan Brady, Chuck Lavaki, Matt Kupskakavishis, and, and Val. Yeah, that, that, that's the name she gave me, Val, sorry. Anyway, I'd like to thank everybody that's supporting the channel on Patreon and everyone that's gotten the war chest, and I will see you soon.